Welcome to Lecture 15, The Music of Southeast Asia. So when we look at this area in Southeast Asia, it encompasses what many people call Oceania, uh, or part of Oceania. And that would include the islands of Indonesia, uh, all of these areas that you can see around my cursor, the Philippines, all the way down to Australia, from the southeast corner of the long, huge peninsula that creates East Asia. Now, the important thing to remember about this is what is known as the recent single origin hypothesis. Now, that means like the out of Africa concept for human migration. So as you can see on this chart, the Homo sapiens, and that's us, are in the red, and we can trace this back about 200,000 years. And with the use of mitochondrial DNA, tracing the genetic material for peoples all over the planet, we can begin to see that migration followed the red arrows. And then Homo erectus, which is a related species to humans, is in the yellow, and then the Neanderthals in the orange area, right around 40,000 years ago. So you can see that the Homo sapiens, us, survived the most, but I want you to notice the pattern of migration. So it follows, especially on this southern area, the sea coasts. And at one time, all of this area was uh, not necessarily underwater. Most of it was actually not. And we'll see that in a few moments. So we're going to focus basically on five countries. Malaysia, Indonesia, the Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam. The reason for that is that uh, this lecture would be way too long if we try to get all 11 countries. And so these are the major musical countries in, that really help identify the sound of Southeast Asia. So let's begin with Malaysia. And Malaysia is um, the nation of Malay. It's a country just as seeping with the traditions of various cultures that interacted with it and colonized it. You'll notice it's right next to Singapore near the Gulf of Thailand and the Java Sea and the South China Sea, and a very important trade area in Southeast Asia. And they hosted settlers for, uh, for centuries, from Portugal, from India, and from China. And so it's a very strong mixture of many different cultures. We're going to look at two instruments. One is the Rebana Ubi drum, which is a ceremonial drum. It's a very, it's giant drum. And, and this was used in dance music, especially. And it kind of became the, the framework for Malaysian dance music. It has ancient origins, but when you hear it uh, played, it's just pretty amazing. It's like a very large bass drum in our culture. And then we have the kompang, and this is kind of a remarkable tambourine-like hand drum. And it's used in national parades and in weddings. And it's become the most played instrument in Malaysia ensembles. So it's kind of like a tambourine, but it doesn't have rattles on it. And once again, it's that hand drum tradition. So we think we can trace these all the way back through human migration to Africa once again. Then let's look at Indonesia. Now, Indonesia is an archipelago. It's many uh, islands. And we have the music of Bali, Sunda, Java, and Sumatra. So that's quite a large area. And this area is known for its conversion to Islam uh, many hundreds of years ago. And so it has, it has a, a, a Chinese tradition, uh, a South Asian tradition, and a Muslim tradition. But one of the interesting things was the production of bronze in Indonesia. And so many of the instruments are made from our metallophones. And so let's look at the Gamelan Orchestra, it representing the islands of Indonesia. It's the most famous music of Indonesia. And you'll notice that it has many different instruments, but most of them are metallophones. Now, they do have a few string instruments and a few percussion instruments, of course, but mostly it's made up of gongs. And when we listen to this and the Gamelan Orchestra, 
will find that it's very, very interesting. Then let's look at the Philippines. Now, the Philippines is another archipelago composed of about 7,641 islands. Now, that's a tremendous amount of very tiny islands and some rather large ones. And what's interesting about this area is the Spanish settlement beginning in 1565, and it led to the Philippines becoming part of the Spanish Empire for more than 300 years. And the archipelago's earliest inhabitants, descendants of the first humans that migrated out of Africa via the coastal route that we mentioned earlier, um, they migrated to an area called Sundaland and Sahul. So if you look at this map to the right of the Philippines, the, there's the Philippines, where my cursor is. This map shows Sunda and Sahul. Now that's Australia, but you'll notice that in this light gray area, that is land that is now underwater. But 20,000 years ago, uh, with uh, the differences in climate, the huge ice age and frozen north, all of this area was between 30 and 40 meters high, lower than it is today. And so this was all habitable land and navigable land. So one could go across this land and settle, and that's how most archaeologists believe this area was settled by, um, by people who have genetic African traits. And it also explains how um, elephants, monkeys, apes, Tigers, tapers, and rhinoceros were able to actually show up in these areas um, because, of course, most of those animals couldn't swim across the ocean. So what we're going to look at is two really important instruments for the Philippines. One is the kulintang, and it's an instrument that uses another collage of gongs that are assembled into a series of knobbed metal plates. So this is really similar to what we saw in Indonesia. And the instruments are organized in a set of eight small gongs. Now the player uses soft sticks, which are made of Maguindanao tropical wood, to subtly perform the melodic notes of a kulitang composition. You'll also note this is almost boat shaped, like canoe shaped. So it actually is easy for carrying and easy for, for manufacture, but that's a rather interesting aside. The next important music for the Philippines is the harana singing, and or well, arana singing, and the genre draws from the classical guitar traditions of Spain. Well, that's not unusual since it was uh, conquered and settled by the Spanish, and re envisions it as a Filipino expression of adoration and melody. So the style is based on the Spanish lyrical courtship melodies and Spanish now Cuban habanera rhythms, immersed in the passion of. Tagalog romantic ballads. So Tagalog is the, nat the natural language of uh, the Philippines. So it's a blending of the Spanish and the native languages. And these are love songs and were traditionally sung as part of courtship and are very beautiful. Then let's look at Thailand. Now there's evidence that the continuous human habitation in present day Thailand from 20,000 years ago to the present day the earliest evidence of rice growing dates back to 2000 BC, and bronze appeared around 1200 to 1000 BC. So the site of Banqiang in northeast Thailand, that's right up in here, currently ranks as the earliest known center of copper and bronze production in Southeast Asia. So Thailand's a huge area and has a tremendous musical tradition, and it's influenced quite a bit by Chinese and as we're going to see African influences. Flenluk Thung is the, means the child of the field song. And it's, this is generally considered the equivalent of Thai country music. And it's very, very interesting. And there's a dance that's associated with it. So we'll watch a video on that. The Khan is one of the most prominent instruments in Thailand and surrounding nations from Laos and onward. Now, the instrument is considered a mouth organ, so there we can take this probably all the way back to pan pipes, to Greek water organs, and probably all the way back to Africa once again, and Egypt especially. And so the, this, it's unique in that there are no reeds in it. 
It has to do with the position of the mouth and the shape of and length and size of the pipes made of bamboo. So that's what's so interesting about this particular instrument. It has a very unique sound and is definitely one of the uh, characteristics of Thai music. And then we look at Vietnam. And Vietnam is very interesting because you'll notice where it's located. It's right on the coast. And it had great Chinese and French influence because of the French actually colonizing this area. And there's still remnants of that today. Uh, but this is very, very interesting music. And we're only going to look at one style today. And that is the Katru. And it's a long-standing tradition in Vietnam culture with uh, providing a soundtrack to Vietnamese festivals, customs, and ritual. And it's usually a trio, three singers, a woman who sings while playing an instrument called the Pach, a man who plays a three-string lute called the Dan Dai, and a woman or man who beats a drum called the Trong Chao. And you'll hear this sound. It's really the songs they speak in a very scholarly manner using words uh, concisely with ample doses of metaphor and imagery for those who are listening. So it's ceremonial music. It's uh, used in sacred music. It's very, very prominent and popular in traditional Vietnamese culture. So your assignment, once again, watch all the videos on Canvas and complete the Google Doc quiz. And we'll see you in class. Thank you. Thank <music> you.